Hey, Amelia Mosley here, bringing you a special about the future of transport. Here's what's coming up. We zoom into the future of high-speed travel and take a ride on a flying car. But first, to electric cars. They're getting more and more common and lots of people would like to see them take over our roads as soon as possible. Let's find out more. When I was a kid, movies told me that cars would be pretty different in the future. They might be driverless. They might fly. Some might even have only two wheels. Oh, I guess that's just a motorbike. And now here we are looking at the cars of the future. Oh, wait, yeah, that just looks like a normal car, hey? Bit disappointing. While they might not look that futuristic, there is one electrifying difference. It's the thing that powers them. Electric cars aren't exactly brand new technology. They were some of the very first cars, and for a while they seemed like the way forward. In 1898, this one was even the fastest car in the world, reaching 60 k's an hour, something this old rev head was clearly stoked about. <coughs> But eventually, the petroleum-powered internal combustion engine took over. It was cheaper to make, easier to power, and could go way faster. Oh, no! Sorry, old boy. Except we now know petrol and diesel has a big downside. Burning it produces air pollution. That's why some car manufacturers have now started moving in another direction, all the way back around to electric vehicles, or EVs if you're feeling lazy. These ones are a little bit more high-tech than their electric predecessors. They're fast, comfy, they can go for a fair distance before needing a recharge, and most importantly, they don't create as much air pollution as petrol and diesel-powered cars. Some countries have already decided to phase those out over the next couple of decades, and there have been calls to do the same thing in Australia. But that could be a little trickier than it sounds, and more expensive. Experts say here in Australia, we'd probably need a few more of these charging stations if more Australians were to start driving EVs. Because even though you don't have to stop at a petrol station, you still do need to charge up on a regular basis. And there's another problem. There aren't really that many models of electric car available in Australia because companies say that not enough people are wanting to buy them. And even the models that are available aren't always that affordable for people like, well, people like me. Come to think, this isn't my car. Something else to consider is the money the government gets from taxing fuel. If people weren't stopping here anymore, it could leave a big hole in Australia's budget. Then there's the fact that a lot of Aussies just really love their petrol and diesel cars and might not be willing to part with them. Couldn't do it. I like my fuel. I'm like, no, that'd be weird. <laughs> While the road to an electric future might be a long, slow and bumpy one, some say it's worth buckling up and starting the journey. Did you know the first cars didn't have steering wheels? They were operated by levers. Next up, imagine travelling overland from Sydney to Melbourne in one hour. Well, that could be the high-speed future of transport. The first human tests have been done on a Hyperloop, a super-speedy levitating train in a tube. Here's Nat to tell you all about it. I wonder what the future of transport will be like. Oh, well, have you heard of those fandangled new things called trains? I wonder what transport will be like in a hundred years. 
Oh, well, have you heard of those fandangled new things called planes? Do you ever think about what transport will be like in a hundred years? Hmm. Well, have you heard of those new fandangled hyperloops? Yeah, welcome to the brave new world of high-speed travel. Yes. These two brave Virgin execs strap themselves in to be the world's first passengers of a Hyperloop. On this trip, they only clocked about 172 k's an hour, but this thing can travel at more than double that. And with some development, they're hoping it'll be able to do over 1,200 k's an hour. Yep, you heard that right, 1,200 k's an hour. That'd mean a trip from Melbourne to Sydney would only take 45 minutes, or a trip from Darwin to Adelaide, two and a half hours. The reason it can go so fast is the lack of friction. That's the force that slows things down when one thing rubs against another, like wheels on tracks or roads. Even moving through the air creates friction. But inside the Hyperloop, there's very little air. Don't worry though, there's air in the capsule so they can breathe. There are also no wheels. Special magnets are used to help the capsule glide along the tube, kind of floating just above the tracks. The idea for the Hyperloop came from none other than Elon Musk. Yep, that's the guy who started Tesla and SpaceX. But Elon did something a little unusual. He released his plans for the Hyperloop as open source for anyone to use, which means lots of companies are working on their own versions. And it's not the only newfangled contraption that could take us zooming around the world in the future. Several companies are working on supersonic passenger planes, that is, planes that fly faster than the speed of sound, which is 1,234 k's an hour. While that's something we've been able to do for a while, they're working on making them cheaper, safer, more efficient, and solving the problem of the loud boom that usually comes from breaking the sound barrier. There are even companies working on hypersonic planes, which can travel faster than Mach 5. That's more than 6,000 k's an hour. But that's also a way off yet. Back on Earth, Virgin are working on making their Hyperloop faster and cheaper, and importantly, making sure it's safe before it can become a reality. For us, the steps moving forward are really to continue to showcase that this technology not only works, but it's actually cost effective. And then the second piece is really to make sure that we can actually have the full length to get up to the speeds that we'd like. Countries like India and Saudi Arabia are already trying to figure out ways to bring Hyperloop to their cities. But whether or not it's the future of transport, well, we'll have to wait and see. I wonder what the future of transport will be like. Oh, well, spoilers. Do you know the name of the world's first supersonic passenger plane? It was the Concorde. The planes, which could travel faster than the speed of sound, first took passengers between London and Paris in 1976, but the last one was retired in 2003. Finally today, we're going to take a drive, or flight maybe, into the future. For generations, people have been dreaming of getting about in flying cars. And while sadly that's not a reality yet, it could be closer than you think. Here's Jack with more. All righty, where to today? York it is. New York, New York. Imagine being able to get in the car, buckle up and fly wherever you want to go. Well, experts reckon flying cars will be part of our everyday lives in the not so distant future. Although I dare say international travel would probably be a little more complicated than this. Wait, should I have gone through customs or something? This is a real-life flying car, the SD-03. Hmm, catchy. Yeah, I know, it doesn't have wheels yet, but the team that built it says they wanted to make sure it could fly before it could drive. 
Recently, they conducted the first successful flight with a person behind the... Uh, uh, wheel? Or joystick? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, the quad propeller vehicle managed a vertical takeoff and then hovered six and a half feet off the ground for four minutes. Mm, okay, so four minutes might not sound that long, but it's still pretty impressive. And SkyDrive reckons we could be flying them as soon as 2023. Now, I know what you're thinking. About time, right? I mean, we've been seeing flying cars in movies for decades. <laughs> there have also been quite a few attempts to build them in real life. In the late 1940s, engineer Malt Taylor built the Aero Car, the first plane car thingy to successfully take flight. How quickly you can convert car into plane. It was tested and approved for mass production, but it never quite took off. Because as a plane, it was too heavy to stay up for long enough, and as a car, well, it wasn't as powerful or comfortable as other road vehicles. They're the sorts of problems that a lot of would-be flying car manufacturers have faced. Building a flying car that's comfortable, fuel efficient, quiet, light, cheap and, most importantly, safe, isn't easy. Plus, there are a bunch of other things to consider, like would people need a pilot's license as well as a driver's license? And how would you make sure all those flying cars don't crash? Would you need an air traffic controller or some sort of skyway like in Back to the Future? These are all big questions that are actually being thought about by authorities around the world as more companies show off their plans for a flying future. New Hampshire in the US became the first place in the world to make it legal to drive a flying car on the road. Although you'd still have to take off and land from an airport. But flying cars definitely have their advantages. Traffic congestion wouldn't be nearly such a problem if you could spread it out, or rather up, into the sky. Plus, you know, who wouldn't want a flying car? They seem pretty cool, right? But while we wait for the future to catch up with our imaginations, we'll be stuck on the ground for a little while longer. Oh, the ground? Oh, but that's so boring. Oh, well. And that's our look at the future of transport. For more info on all of our specials, including heaps of teacher resources, just head to our website. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you soon. Bye.